Hello. Welcome to Whispers in the Theater. I'm your host, the Whispering Gardener Shu, here to continue our exciting tale. The Other Side of Myth, Chapter 2 The Speckled Beast. Shadows coalesced in the quiet of the night, weaving a lean and large feline body, white and spotted blue. It raised his nose, breathing in the air, feeling static run through his fur. It missed his meals the other night, but an extra helping lurked nearby. Through shrubs it crawled, and on roofs it crept, following the scent to an alley a mile away. A young couple giggled below, the man's arms wrapped around the woman's waist as his lips teased her neck. They were freshly free from dinner. The beasts could smell the fine meal upon them, finished with a glass of wine. Perfect. It loved this type of dinner. Sitting on its haunches, it let things play out, watching for the most appetizing moment. I told you I'd make this fantasy true. The man whispered loudly in her ear. It was just a fantasy. She laughed excitedly. We can't really do this. There are cameras everywhere. Let's give them a show then. The whisper was lower this time, and as their lips met, the creature grinned. It bounded from the roof, shadow blotting out the moon overhead. The overcast made the couple stop and made them turn as it landed heavily. Bemusement, oh so delicious, played across their faces. And then came horror. As realization dawned, they had heard about it and were suddenly realizing fear had a form. It was a powerful thing of nightmares. Teeth like daggers were grinning, animal, but with intelligence and golden eyes. It saw their misconceptions die. If it was just a normal beast, maybe they could survive but they could feel how far from normal it was. It only made the grin worse. Oh no, the woman gasped. Isn't that the animal that's been on the news? She cowered behind the man and suddenly thrust into a row. He puffed out his chest. Don't worry, babe. This thing isn't gonna hurt us. Fury in his eyes. The beast licked his teeth. Come on, then. Try me, you stupid animal. The man reached into his jacket, pulling out a box. It unfolded into a shiny black pistol, its dark lens taking sight. The man thumbed the dial, and the weapon buzzed to life. Come on, try me. Again, the man barked. The beast replied with inhalation. There came a roaring crash of power, blue light erupting from his mouth. The man spun back at the blast hit, his girlfriend screaming as she ducked. His gun spun away as he crashed on his back. He made a scramble for it, and the beast pounced. It pushed the air out of him as it came down, flashing its fangs before his eyes. He tried to grab his face, and a paw swatted his. As his head turned back, the beast licked his grin. The fight flared the man's eyes, and finally it ripped claws across his throat. Mist rose from the wound instead of blood. It took his neck between his teeth, squeezing to pour the mist faster. Behind them, 
There came a buzz and a flash. A light bullet hit. It dropped the man as smoke rose from his pelt. Licking his teeth, it grinned as the woman gulped. Get away from him, or I'll blast the hole right through you. Her finger nursed the dial. Done anyway. It turned and raced toward her. The lights broke against it as she held down the trigger, doing all of nothing as it jumped over her head. Landing, it snagged her leg, dragging her to the ground. When the gun didn't drop, it slammed her against the wall. Tears welled as she dropped it herself, sobs breaking the words on her lips. The plead for mercy, the cry for help. When was the last time it heard either? The plea was the best. It meant they really understood how outmatched they were. It exhaled hot breath upon her face and nudged her chin up. This time, its fangs broke the flesh as it drank deep. It licked them again when it was through and sniffed the air. They were barely more than a snack. Hunger was already calling. There was something in the breeze, though, more appetizing than this. It could smell the scent of strength, not food, calling with siren songs leaving them for some other fool to find. It stalked back into the night, hoping a challenge truly awaited. When morning came, this event was a breaking story. Kiara's parents paid passive attention, sitting down with their kids for breakfast. She decided to be frank when she told them everything, and an animal attack couldn't steal their minds. There were far more pressing things, after all. A talk with the principal shouldn't bear that much weight, but her father made it clear the weight was distinctive enough. He poured a part of pancake and waved the piece around. You know, I really hate blight, he said, as if it were a sudden epiphany. He asked why one of the war kings of the Bono Empire. He always has that smug look on his face, like his bloody campaign is a solution to a drought. Wow, her brother, Jalik, intoned. Are you going to fight him? His eyes widened, and her father laughed hard. That was a bad analogy, Roke. Her mother, Kana, sighed and took a sip of coffee. I mean... He's an administrator, as big a deal as he makes about it. He's not going to war. So, he did kind of fall into power, didn't he? Yeah, and Blight is such a war king name, too. Erok smirked. Blight, Terra, Scourge. You know, the Vano naming convention was rather lazy. He nodded, and her mother sighed. And for the next month, we're going to see just how lazy it was. Her words stung Kiara. At the end of the school year, her parents always spent the month away, leaving her and Jalik in their aunt's care. They went to sites for the local museum, doing archaeological and anthropological research. Usually, they enjoyed the little job. Usually. But the Vano Empire was next. There was little else to see in Vano. Little left for scholars to discover. Kiara didn't care for history herself, but she could remember too many bored conversations. This area was ruled by another person calling themselves Scourge. No, there's no relation to the previous one. Yes, the people fear their war king. Yes, he was blind and didn't see his inevitable fall. If a person had money and Bono blood, then they'd happily fund an expedition. 
if a person had money and vinyl blood, they probably saw the million's name attached to the research. Even after leaving the museum, her mother came back on special requests. Her father had it worse, often subject to some war descent and tree. The next month was going to take a toll on them, and she had hoped they'd meet it with peace. Now, though, she'd be on their minds. If she could get into so much trouble in one day, what would the coming weeks bring? Maybe they wouldn't see it like that, but she ate quietly nevertheless, hoping to minimize the chance. Vano and Blight. Damn, where's our luck? Erog raised his coffee to this, and Connor joined the toast. Kiara should toast too, Jalik laughed. She joined in, figuring the goodwill couldn't hurt. In the end, her mother lost the coin toss. Kiara couldn't look at her as they drove through the gray morning, watching the city instead through the passenger window. Already off to a bad start, it felt like the day could still get worse. There was just something about it she could feel in the air. She wasn't sure how it'd manifest, but stared nevertheless. Maybe the stranger would appear again. Should she tell her mother about him? Maybe not. As strange as he was, he didn't bring harm. They stopped at a light and her eyes lingered on framing in the distance. She had seen the construction site before, but it somehow resonated with her feelings now. She truly took it in, this iron skeleton rising from the ground. It would be another building one day, but for now, she felt it beckon. Noticing her gaze, her mother spoke. At the school, she said, referring to the university at which she taught. One of my co-workers told me about that place. Apparently, the guy paying for the construction suddenly poured his money out. He thinks it's hunted or something. Can you believe that? Isn't that such a waste of man hours? She smiled. Kiara wondered if she saw the disquiet on her. I wonder what it would have been. She watched it and thought it was sort of like her now. Neither knew their future, but could see nothing promising around the bend. Actually, I kind of want to know, too. They pulled away, and they drove off. Kiara thought she saw the stranger heading for the site. They arrived at her school mere moments after dropping Jalik off. She rushed inside toward what she hoped would end quickly. Kana was not in such a hurry. Taking her time, she fitted well with the casual year-in atmosphere. With coiling dark hair secured with a band, she walked behind her daughter, in a tan blouse and blue slacks. A pair of sunglasses hung at her side, completing the look of a relaxed mother, complemented by the soft tap of her shoes. They stopped in front of the office just long enough for a camera to search their faces, and when the door slid open, they slid inside. The woman at the desk let out a sigh as she put her hands together, can you start this amicably? I haven't put on any coffee yet, and I'm not ready to hear anything from Theodore. She was a stout person on the older side, soft wrinkles on her face, a world-weary look in her eyes. She didn't need to know Kiara's mother to know how this would go. You could recognize the overprotective ones before they said a word, but it was the ones who knew they were right that stood out the most. Connor merely nodded with a smile on her face. As the secretary called over the intercom, they walked past the desk and into Blythe's office. Mrs. Million and Miss Million, he forced a smile. Now, now, Theodore, please, just call me Connor. Her mother returned one, her dark eyes lighting up. 
Blight's silence was almost physical in response, but still, he held the facade and nodded. Connor's in. I hope you can forgive me. I hate to call you or any other parent in so close to the end of the year. In this week alone, I had to talk to several about a group of male students vandalizing local stores. You see, the owners came here because they recognized our uniforms. So, of course, I did what was necessary to make the boys correct the errors. He spoke matter-of-factly, but the obvious boasting was on full display. What I'm saying here is that I'm nothing if not thorough. His smile reflected his pride. Far be it for me to call you nothing, Theodore, Connor chirped sharply, breaking Blight's facade. He grimaced for a long moment before noticing, hurrying along when he did. Well, Connor, do you know why you're here? Because someone poured a prank on my daughter. Yes, that's exactly what... But do you know the whole story? Connor cut him off and his weary eyes widened. I believe I do. I don't think so. She crossed her arms. The last teacher Kiara had is a friend of mine, you see. When I called her up, she told me that Kiara went to her locker about 15 minutes before class was through. While I'm a professor, it did make me wonder, what is the likelihood of two unrelated students going into the same hallway around the same time? It made me suspicious, honestly. Miss Million, I assure you I looked into the matter. Hearing his response, the woman thought her husband was right. It sounded like Blight heard the challenge and was rising to face it. Now, now, Theodore. Well, Connor, I assure you I looked into the matter. When the girls were called to my office, I spent ten minutes finding out what happened. He went on. She smirked. Is that so? Yes. Miss Stewart was let out of class to retrieve a project drive from her locker. I see. Then was the drive with her? Yes, Connor. It was. Kiara's eyes widened as he said this. The tone was telling. Did he like talking to adults like they were students? She looked at her mother. Then why was Miss Stewart near Kiara's locker? I mean, Kiara, does she have a class with you? A few. Is her locker near yours? No. Our lockers are near our homerooms, and hers is on the other side of school. So, Theodore, what exactly brought Emily to that side of the school? Was her class over there? No, I don't believe it was. Blight shrunk. Then could it be that someone else told Emily Kiara was heading off? I mean, it sounds pretty convenient that there were a group of students in the hallway at the time. And all of them were Emily's friends, too. I suppose. Then Kiara's reaction to both you and to Emily was somewhat justified, right? Connor placed her hands on her lap. She could smell coffee in the air and was rather proud of how long she had managed to hold off. Her words hadn't been gentle, but she had at least been cordial at the start. When Blight responded, Kiara watched the fall of yet another war king. He started with the same strength as before, the powerful man talking down the angry parent. His weapons of choice were tenure and assurance. He had been at this for years, and his decisions always proved fair. Even if the prank was coordinated, Kiara wasn't in the right for the fight. He armed himself with indignation, offended that her mother would even imply such a thing. Meanwhile, Kana sat poised and patient. She left the man prattle on like a toddler crying out, and when he sat up, confident in the silence, she crossed her legs. Her counterattack began. What good were tenure and assurance if such a small detail was so easily missed? What right did Blight have in this position if Connor saw this before she even left the house? 
Certainly, Kiara shouldn't have started a fight, but she was suddenly outnumbered. Was she just supposed to run away? And then what? Be victim to a prank again? How far could the kids go before they earn retribution? Didn't Emily leave this office like she played no hand in the assault? And it certainly wasn't assault. What type of man was Blythe if he let it happen and the perpetrator got away? In this verbal battle, Blight crumbled at the force of shame and disappointment. He seemed older when Connor was through, and while Kiara was still in trouble for insubordination, she left the office with a smile on her face. The rest of the day went by quietly. When she reunited with her friends, she told them what her mom had done. If Kiara the firecracker, then her mom the bomb. She laughed wildly. Taylor smiled proudly. Kiara, let me have your mom. If it were mine, she would have just said it was my fault. That woman can never accept that she lost to me. Well, that's because you're a troublemaker. She laughed. You used to always fight first, and sometimes, maybe, you'd think about it later. Actually, I have you know that I'm always sarcastic before I fight. Taylor grinned, and the four of them snickered. Speaking of your mom, though, Taylor, I heard she was up at the school, Tristan said, and Taylor's grin widened. I can't imagine her not being in the principal's office, Kiara gasped. Well, she wasn't. She actually came to see the coach. Hey, Shin, anything in the news about that beast you were talking about? Taylor shot a look at him. He pulled out his mobile. There was a new notification waiting. Apparently, a Calayan hunting party is coming to Iravel to hunt the beast. The mayor believes that if anyone can catch it, it'll be a Calayan hunter. Shin said this proudly. He was Calayan himself and had two hunter grandfathers. It wasn't his pride to bear, but he wouldn't throw it away. That's right. A clay and hunting party is on their way to Iravel, and you know what? I get to hunt with them. Taylor reached into her bag, pulling out a folded bar. She pressed the switch, and it unfolded into a bow. Her friend's eyes went wide. Is that a clay and smart bow? Kiara coveted the collapsible weapon. Taylor flaunted it. Shin licked his lips. It's a new model, too. It's the one with the vital marker and probability check. If you're about to hit a vital spot, it'll tell you. It'll also tell you if you're about to miss. Taylor pulled at the string. The string is a quarter elastic material, too. If the bow detects a target within proximity of you, the string will adjust itself for efficient firing. It goes very well with the hunter's fierce fire speed. It has to be great for strength training, too. Tristan nodded, and Taylor reached into her bag. She pulled out a small metal capsule and turned it between her fingers. They also gave me about thirty arrows to go along with it. She flicked the capsule into a slot in the bow. Of course, it won't let me fire without permission. If I load a capsule and try to draw back, it sends a signal to a Calayan satellite. The satellite will then scan my area, and if a threat is undetected, then the stream will be locked up. Or so, that's what the coach was saying to my mom. But what if you're inside a building? Kiara asked. Biometric scans, most likely. It'll assess your heart rate and body temperature for indications of stress. Tristan examined the bow's grip as he said this. Taylor nodded. Worst case scenario. There's also a camera. It'll start recording in the event that my stress levels go up and transmit the video to the Calayan satellite, she said. Shin held up his hand suddenly. Okay, uh, this is cool and all, but why do you have a Calayan smart bow? And furthermore, why do you get to hunt with the hunting party? Remember how the archery club went to Calaya last month? Well, we went there to represent Iraville in a hunting game. All of the sister cities were invited. You'll be happy to hear that I was third place. Shin's expression flattened. Only third place, huh? No wonder I didn't hear about it. He scoffed, and Taylor trained her bow on him. He stroked his chin. Still, with a Calayan smart bow, 
We could go after the speckled beast ourselves. His eyes lit up. You mean I could go after him? Taylor sighed. No, think about it. Tristan and Kiara can be the distraction while you take the beast out. I'll even record it, and then you'll be famous. Why were we distracted? Kiara shot him a look. He grinned. Because you two are all about staying in shape. I'm not a slouch. But Tristan does his night routine, and you're on the track team. You guys are basically ninjas. He nodded vigorously. Tristan raised his hand. Shin, how are we going to find an animal that not even the police can find? Shin looked to Kiara. According to the news this morning, there was an attack near your house. All we need to do is follow the clues. Kiara, have you seen anything strange around recently? Easily the stranger, but this was the first time she wondered if the two were connected. If she believed the stories, they shared a transient quality. The speckled beast came and went. It was a powerful force, but left only victims in its wake. The city had become his jungle, and every crack and crevice was a place for it to hide. Maybe it wasn't hiding after all. The stranger certainly wasn't. He didn't seem like he had to. He was a man that moved on passing breezes, only present long enough for shaken trees to settle. She felt like she saw him accidentally before, and even earlier seemed to happen by chance. The more she thought about it, the more it made sense. It was like the moment in a game where the big bad appears and leaves the boss monster behind. She told her friends as much, but left the last bit out. There was no room for such levity in minds so clearly troubled. Okay, so like, even if we weren't really going to hunt the monster, we're definitely walking you home now, Kiara, Shin said. Yeah, that guy is creepy, and you're too short and fragile to be running into people like that. Taylor's grip tightened on her bow. Kiara suspected that if she could carry it openly, she would never put it away. To be honest, we shouldn't have been letting you go home by yourself anyway. We can all walk together, but you have to walk like five streets by yourself. So came Tristan, and Kiara let out a sigh. This was not the first time either of them insisted they walk her home, and it was not the first time she said what she said next. I can take care of myself. She hoped it didn't sound as clipped as it did in her head. Her friends went silent, and she knew it did. Still, they shook their heads. We're walking you home until the school year is over. Taylor crossed her arms. The boys nodded, and for once, Kiara accepted defeat. If the man did turn out to be dangerous, it'd be great to have them around. At the very least, if he appeared again, she might not feel so insane. Some distance away, the speckled beast prowled the shadows of buildings. It found other meals between now and last night, but longed for the enticing thing in the air. It tracked it late into the night, but as if it were a race, the smell disappeared. All it could do was lay in wait. The prey could hide, but it was still in this area. With a bit more time, it would rise again. Although, it was a wretched shame about this spot. Children were getting out of school, loudly moving as they obliviously passed by. Their trinkets and toys beeped and chimed, killing the few moments of silence between their breaths. The beast grumbled, low and angry. Perhaps it could eat again. A child would be little more than a treat. As a particularly small one lagged behind his group, the beast crept forward, running his tongue across his teeth. It was going to snatch him before any of his friends could notice. It let out a roar and let him scream just so they knew they were next. 
it eased closer at the thought when suddenly the smell returned. From the shadows it bounced up the wall, taking in the breath just to taste it on the air. It leaped from roof to roof, tracking it down, certain the meal would vanish if it lingered too long. The route took it up the street, away from the shops, en route to houses. A group of teens gathered below, four of them, blind like all before, laughing without a care. Another deep breath told the beast who it was. Among the crowd, there was a girl, eyes round and scarlet like nothing he had ever seen. She was the strength this hunger craved, and it lowered itself in excitement. As their words met his ears, his excitement only grew. It's going to be amazing, trust me, Shin was still going. We'll all be heroes, the students who slew the speckled beast. Doesn't that have a nice ring to it? You've been brainstorming that all this time, haven't you? Taylor cocked an eyebrow. The others laughed. It doesn't make sense, Shin. If the mayor needs a hunting party, how are we going to stop this thing? You know he's going to repeat the plan, Kiara snickered. It's a good plan. Trust me on it. I don't know. He's kind of convincing me. Tristan stroked his chin. Shin threw an arm around his shoulder. If Tristan is thinking about it, you know I'm right. The girls rolled their eyes. Fine. If we somehow run into that thing, we'll take it out. Taylor sighed, and the boys high-fived. The speckled beast growled happily to itself, leaping from the roof to land loudly behind them. They stopped turning with that fast-dawning terror. It let them look into his golden eyes, let them see its blatant intelligence. It growled low, and the tall boy gulped. Well, Shin swallowed hard. I think this is your chance, Taylor. He looked at her, and she fumbled to pull her bow out of her bag. He did not want to see this, and started wildly looking for somewhere to go. We really don't have time, Taylor, Tristan trembled. In a fleeting moment of clarity, he thought to add, Why isn't it coming after us? And the others searched the beast's eyes. It wants us to run, Kiara clenched her fist. The beast wagged his tail in confirmation. She stepped forward, grabbing a pendant around her neck. What are you doing? Shin grabbed her. The look she gave back almost made him immediately let go. She was something more ferocious than the monster, too mad at its audacity to remember she was flesh and bone. For a moment, Shin was more afraid of her, but kept that to himself as he pulled her back. I got it! Taylor suddenly yelped as she drew the bow, loading five arrows into it. The beast growled. It fought far too many like her. It didn't even need to smell. The weakness was plain on her face. A golden eye glare fell onto her, and she lifted her bow despite it. I think you're the one who should be running. She pulled the string and one of the capsules fell to her hand. It unfolded into a thin arrow, fastening to the grip. Shin pulled a pair of goggles over her eyes. As readings rode across it, she let the arrow fly. Flitting through the air, it buried itself above the beast's eye. The monster let out a roar, batting it free. Thoughts of letting them run faded from his mind. It bounded forward, Taylor loosing an arrow into his leg. With a tumbling stop, the others ran away. Taylor lingered for a moment, wondering if she should shoot again. As if her arrows were mosquito bites, it rose to his feet, 
roaring once to rev her fear. She turned, following on her friend's heels. The beast came lumbering after them, bulk heaving as it snarled and growled. They only stayed ahead by the grace of sharp turns, leaving it to crash into walls and gates, and yet it stayed on their tail. Plenty of people had ran before, and their escape would be no different. It took a breath as they sighted another turn. Crashing heavy, but not quite hard, it spat a roar at Taylor's back. She hid the ground and the bow slid away. It pounced, happy for the appetizer. A pipe smashed the side of his head. Shin drew back and swung again. The beast roared, and Taylor leaped after her bow. It turned to roar at her and realized where it was. A construction site opened around them. All the other kids armed themselves with pipes. No one had tried to fight like this before, and it would show them why. First the archer with her pointy little sticks, his body lowered, muscles tight, springing forward with explosive force. Claws went up and the speckled beast towered, shin swinging for the back of his legs. It fell over and Taylor pulled back. His massive paw swung before Shin could do the same. He flew like rubbish and an arrow hit his side. It roared with annoyance, not pain. That archer again, and another pipe against his head. It did little more than knock his head aside. Tristan swung again, and it knocked it away. As his mouth snapped out, Kiara hit it next. The boy struck before it even acknowledged her. The two of them pummeled unabated. Strong metal waited for the swing. Shin came back with a leap through the air. He put in everything as he struck his back, scattering as his friends did the same. The beast pushed up, and three arrows found his neck. It clawed, tearing them out taking in a deep breath. As the boys came back, it let it out. A burst flung them away. Tristan dented the side of machinery. Shin spun into tatters across the ground. Both boys went still, and the beast went for Taylor. She shot, and it dodged wide, running along the outskirts, drawing close. It pounced and Kiara did too. Her pipe hit it like a lance, pushing it aside. As it tumbled back to its feet, it remembered why it was here. The girl put herself in front of her friend, and it smiled, happy again. Kiara wasn't smiling. It took Taylor's distraction to power that charge, and the boys were not getting up. To make matters worse, oh so much worse, this thing was neither bleeding nor bruised. Despite how hard she and Tristan hit, despite how many arrows Taylor shot, this thing was still okay, and she could see that frustration was all that filled his eyes. All this time, even though they held it back, they did little more than delay his game. This pipe wouldn't work, and arrows wouldn't either. She reached for her pendant and watched his eyes widen. This thing knew. Could it be here for her? As she turned to check the boys, it took in a breath. She only wanted to see their chest move and got slammed into Taylor for it. They hit an iron beam, and the bow slid away. Taylor slumped to the ground, blood pouring from an unseen wound. Kiara's heart skipped a beat. She looked back to see the beast shaking. It was like it was laughing, and her friend's lies were the joke. She took hold of her pendant. 
For his part, the beast grew anxious at the building of the scent. It pounced and her hand came up. A rush of air forced it to a stop, claws digging into the dirt. She swept her hand up and its claws came free. Above the ground, above the roofs, the wind tossed it high. As his body twisted, putting his feet below, something dawned. It was a realization. It recognized that feeling in others, but never in itself. It realized it was in danger, and it was too late to run. Fear ends in the drop. The wind touched its back and shoved. The impact rose through muscle and bone, and the speckled beast shook. The girl's eyes glowed as she swung her hand. It went higher this time. It could see the flash of sirens growing close. The wind touched his back and shoved even harder. It felt something crack against the ground, but couldn't find it through the cacophony of pain. The well of sirens died as they arrived. It looked at them as if they could help and found the lenses of guns looking back. It didn't fear these things. And yet, a bolt tore through it. More flew, aim concentrated, and the bees roared as its body broke apart. Pain, not annoyance. And then it was gone. Remnants glitter on the wind. People stared confused, but quickly got to work. Officers secured the area, while paramedics rushed to the students' aid. Kiara could only stare in shock as she was checked. How had that been so easy? Did that mean she could have ended this sooner? She looked at her friends, breathing deeply as the medics pressed injections to their arms. She cursed herself, too. If the battle was truly that simple, none of them had to get hurt. She decided something as officers came over with questions. In these last two weeks, she'd tell her friends what she could do. Chapter 2 Ends And so to ends another episode of Whispers in the Theater. I would be delighted if you were to join me once again.